Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to see you all. I hope you didn't have too much of a problem finding a parking space. Uh, I'm sure the gentlemen outside were all helpful in directing you. Yes, good. Hey, I haven't seen Linda Dore in a long time. How are you, dear? Good. Good, 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 good. Okay. <laughs> Let, could we rise, please, for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now if we could have a moment of silence for all of our first responders. Today we are dedicating this meeting, as you know, to our veterans, uh, past and our present people in the military. So let's think about them and all of the people that keep us safe. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to introduce our members. Some of our members could not be here today. Um, this is a uh, cold season, and even if they had a sniffle, they didn't want to show up because they wanted to be sure that we kept all the seniors safe. So you'll notice that a couple of us are missing. Uh, Francis, would you like to start and introduce yourself? Francis McVetty, Yorktown Heights, 50 years. Daryl Lindholm, secretary, only 16 years. Hi, Jenny Menton. Too many years, since the 50s. <laughs> I've been here since the 50s. Rosemary Panio, 51 years. I was two when I came here. I feel a little badly now. It's, I'm Deborah Marks. I live in Shrub Oak, and I've been here since 2019. <laughs> a newcomer. Uh, Joe Falcone, Parks and Recreation. Councilman Ed Lachterman. Okay, thank you all. Today we're going to do a special thanks to our Yorktown veterans and first responders. I'm sure you in this room all are so appreciative of all of our veterans and uh, the work that they have done in the past to, uh, to keep us a uh, safe and free country and all of our first responders because as you know, Yorktown was, I believe, nominated the 11th safest town in the United States, not just in the state of New York. So um, there's a reason to that. So our thanks go out to them. Our first speaker today is Carl Libertor. He's the first commander of the Yorktown American Legion, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about senior issues, uh, uh, veterans' issues. First, thank you. Thank you. I forgot the D in front of the Liberto. <laughs> D Liberto. Ah, D. Uh, hello, D Libertor. Uh, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, um, just to introduce myself. I'm a Vietnam veteran. I belong to the Westchester County uh, VVA, Chapter 49. I'm on their board. That's the only one in the, it's a county uh, group. I'm a member of the American Legion. I'm the first vice commander there, 109 on Veterans Road. I am a life member of the VFW, also on Veteran, Veterans Road. Uh, I didn't really know until now what I was going to talk about. I had put some stuff together for the posts and the groups. Uh, besides these three organizations, we have the DAV. I'm not sure if they meet anymore uh, or even where the post is. There is the Purple Heart Association, Post 21. Um, the Korean War veterans, I think, have disbanded, I don't know. Now, looking at what's available to veterans, and first, I want to thank everybody for their support of all the veterans, all the military first responders, and our deceased veterans. Um, and just to let you know, if you weren't aware, this past Friday on Veterans Day, we dedicated the War on Terror Memorial at Patriots Park back mm -hmm. here or whatever they're calling Patriots Park today, because there's no official name. Um, the, what's available, uh, these organizations will help or assist veterans. Uh, any questions, um, anything that comes up that you don't know about, 
uh, we try to answer or we'll get the answer. Now, in the county of Westchester, there is the Veterans Services Organization. Uh, it's run by the county for veterans, and if anything is going through for a veteran that needs assistance, they are the ones that really know what's going on. Um, one of my uh, members at the VVA is one of the service officers down there, very knowledgeable, Danny Griffin. He works for uh, Mr. Tochi, Ron Tochi, and they come under the county. Um, a very good group. They know their stuff. So if anybody is in the need of assistance, putting in a claim, they're the ones to see. Now, also in Montrose, we have the, VV, the, VA, the VA hospital. We also have the New York State Veterans Nursing Home. We, until recent, well, until COVID, the VVA Chapter 49 ran the gift shop there. A uh, very nice group of people in there. It's a wonderful nursing home for veterans, for their wives. Um, up at Castle Point, there is another hospital, um, another VA hospital. And down in the Bronx, I forget the town. But these are all available to veterans. And if any veteran needs assistance or they have a question, they could come to the v VFW, come to the American Legion. Uh, we'll try to point you in the correct uh, direction. If you're already assisted by the VA, then you know what is available to you. A um, little history of both the VFW and the American Legion. Uh, the VFW is the oldest military organization. Uh, began after the Sp Spanish-American War and the Philippine Insurrection, and it was established in 1899. Uh, some of the groups banded together in 1914 to form the VFW, and it's made up of approximately 1.5 million veterans. The American Legion is made up roughly of 2 million American uh, veterans. Um, the post here, Yorktown VFW, was chartered in 1946, um, and the Quonset hut that we have our meetings in and is there for available. It was moved here from Darien, Connecticut in 1952, and we have approximately 50 to 60 members. The American Legion was chartered in 1919 uh, as a patriotic veterans organization focusing on service veterans, service members, and communities. In the 20s, uh, the Legion's efforts resulted in the creation of the U.S. Service Bureau forebearer of the VA. Now, the VFW was also in, involved in the uh, establishing of the Veterans Administration and development of the National Cemetery System. Um, the Yorktown uh, American Legion, though it was char uh, it was founded in the 20s. And this is, there's a little convolution of dates we, with the chartering of it. They got chartered in 1931, but the Ladies Auxiliary was chartered in 1926. Now, I don't know if that was the Ladies Auxiliary National or of this post. So that was, some of the history in the town is gone. Now, the, there, we were located on Veterans Road, and uh, during the 20s and the first half of the 30s, they used to meet in Dunning's Garage on Commerce Street. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody's been around here that long to know where Dunning's Garage was. I'm not, and I'm here 49 years. And, and, we, uh, would and we would never admit to it anyway. Okay, that's mm -hmm. fine. That's all right. It's on Commerce Street someplace. Uh, 1935, after this building was built, the American Legion used to meet in the basement. Um, and then the, the post -char uh, charter member, uh, New York Times first police chief, er Earl Hawke, 
was instrumental in, instrumental in having uh, W. Fields Osgood donate land on Route 6 west of Cherry, uh, Strawberry Street, Strawberry Road, I'm sorry. Um, since the population was heaviest in Yorktown, they sold that land, purchased what is on um, Veterans Road, and built a building, and that was opened in 1957. And currently we have 119 members. So some of the programs we have is Honor Flags, the Memorial Park Brig Program, Boys and Girls State. Uh, we assist the community services when called upon. That is also true of the VFW. Uh, food collection for the VA pantry, rendering honors for deceased veterans, um, which last week we had two. We probably had four in the last two weeks. Where we'll go to either Clark or Yorktown funeral parlors when called upon and give uh, rendering last honors to the veteran. Mm -hmm. All right. um, now, those are the, the two. The Vietnam veterans um, were established in 1982, and we have approximately 347 members, but we're throughout the county. Some members don't even live in state anymore, but they stay with us. Um, that's about it, but one little statistic here, since we did talk about deceased veterans. According to the DOJ, the best estimate that uh, between 2.7 and 3.2 million served in Vietnam during 54 and 75, and approximately 610 of us are still alive. Oh my God. Um, and of course, we lost over 58,400 yeah. in Nam. The great loss of the Vietnam veterans is due to Agent Orange, Orange uh, herbicide that was sprayed as a defoliant. Um, and because of that, there is a lot of uh, presumptive um, diseases, cancers. Uh, they added hypertension, but they're not going to give any compensation for another four years. Mm. Good old government that we have. Mm. Um, and in so doing, when they got to pay for something else, instead of going back to the government asking for more money for veterans, they take something away. So they took away sleep apnea and uh, something else to pay for some of their other uh, diseases. Um, but, you know, we're hanging in there, and the unfortunate thing about Agent Orange, if a veteran or military member while serving in Nam got a dose of Agent Orange where it affected them, it also transferred to their children and oh. grandchildren. It's a terrible thing. Our director, Danny Griffin, who I mentioned, uh, he had a daughter born... <laughs> Um, his second daughter was born after he came back from Nam, and she had damage to the cartilage in her nose due to Agent Orange. So it is a terrible thing. But if anybody is affected or thinks they're affected, they should contact especially uh, the services down in White Plains. And um, it's really... <laughs> Really, all I can say, unless we have questions in the audience. Yes. Anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? Uh, I have one question. Can I ask you? In the beginning, you gave us the name of Dave Griffin. Is there a phone? If anybody needs any help, is there a phone number that we could have, or is that uh, not? Um, actually, uh, on our on our town website, there is a page for the Veterans Advisory Committee, and on that page has all of the information to reach Westchester County. Okay, but you good. Have, not everybody has access, sure. as we right. know. Would you have a phone number that? No, I don't have one with me. That All right, then I'll because we're making a list of numbers, and I would like I, to be. I able will get you that information, Jenny. Okay, I'll work to put that on the but list. One other thing I forgot to mention: I'm also on the Yorktown Veterans Advisory Board <laughs> with our liaison. Okay. Your liaison. Uh, is there any other questions? Uh, do you, can you? Approximately, tell us how many veterans are in Yorktown. Uh, 
you want me to you want me to feel this one, Carl? Yeah, go ahead. All right, I'll, I'll, you I'll, probably got figures. I'll be your, I'll be your Derek Jeter. So <laughs> right now there are approximately one thousand and seven and seventy four veterans who have exemptions in the town of Yorktown. So there are probably more than that, uh, and out of those, seven hundred and forty of them are uh, seniors. Yeah, the um, between the two posts, we've got approximately 180 members. And out there, there's post one in the American Legion, and there's another post that people join the organization, but they don't come into uh, either one of the organizations. They'll stay out there, and these, they basically belong to the American Legion or the BFW, but not to a particular post. Okay. Now, are you oh. saying that... If anyone has a question who is a veteran or a family member of a veteran, they can walk into the VFW and ask for help and direction. Well, they can ask, basically, if they have a question, see what the question is, and uh, they'll direct them. Now, you got to find out when they're open, <laughs> when either one. The best one, if neither one is open, it's a pressing question, they should contact the County Veterans Advisory, uh, not the advisory, uh, services. County? County Veterans, veterans Services. services. Uh, at your post, do you have a sign that says when you're open so if people come there? Because most of us know where they are, but we would know. If they <laughs> <laughs> the American Legion opens for happy hour, but if you look at the <laughs> sign on, if you look at the sign on the on the wall, it's wrong, and I've asked them to, <laughs> to change it. Um, but they're open for happy hour on Friday afternoons between 5 and 8. And, Good time to go. And then it's a hit and miss. Well, maybe they could just call that number. Uh, yeah, leave a message. The they can we call. have a number on the website if you call that number, and that would be a start. Yes, because you can leave a message and somebody will get back to them. Right. Now, the VFW, we're open more because the bar is more active at the VFW. So they could always walk in and at least leave a message with the bartender okay. who is ever there. I, okay. I would just like to make one comment, if that's okay. I feel with our audience, and I know we have a TV audience also, if anyone, you know, veterans, husband, wife, whatever, if someone gets sick or there's a problem, just make sure you make that one phone call to find out what you're entitled to and what they can do for you. Through experience, we learned a lot from that. And I'm not going to go into detail, but it's very, very important that you call a number and find out wh where you would go, who you would talk to, to find out how they can help you with your particular situation because they have a lot of help for you and they, they are there for you. So just remember that. It's very important because there's a lot of things that they can help you with. Uh, one other thing that uh, just came to mind, when you're discharged from the military, honorably, you get a DD-214. Now, when we have membership coming into the, uh, well, both organizations required show proof of service. Now, the American Legion, anybody could join the American Legion since December 7, 1941. They changed the rules years ago, which I couldn't understand because during the cold periods, between wars, those veterans were not allowed to join the American Legion. I mean, you got your uniform on and everything. You just you got out honorably. You just didn't go to a uh, combat zone. Whereas the VFW is, you have to have been in a uh, combat zone and received the service medal f due to that um, period. But now anybody from December... 7, 1941 could join the American Legion if they did not belong, go to a combat zone. Now, like myself, I was a NAM. I could join either or both organizations, which I did. Um, but one thing with the DD-214, we've had instances where we're notified by the funeral parlor that we have a veteran, but they didn't have a DD-214, so they couldn't get the services from the branch that they served in. Because at a burial site, or sometimes at the um, a funeral home, the military will come in and do a flag ceremony. 
um, where they'll take the flag, fold it, and present it to the family. Uh, usually they'll do that at the cemetery. But we've had instances where they came in, and because the person was a member, we have it on file. Another way to have it on file is to do it through the county. Uh, I came in here one day when they were doing passports, and I now have my DD-214 down at the county, as well as the both VFW American Legion. State has it because of my license plate. Um, so, But it's very important. If they don't have the DD-214, if you know of, of a service discharge have them find their D214. They can go back to the government, but that takes months right. to yeah, get. Yes. But it's a very important document for when they dis pass away because I think we do get something from the government when we're gone. It's not much, you know, but uh, whatever they give, we'll take it. So once again, to reiterate, if they come in to see you, your your group, uh, you will give them all this information. If they're if they're ill and need some guidance or for whatever, they can get all that information from you. I just want our TV audience to understand that. Right. If they can't get it from us, we'll try to direct them to. The okay, rest. or you will direct them where to go. Sure. Wonderful, very good. Once again, we thank you for your service. Well, thank you. We thank you for being here today. Thank you. I'm very proud to have served. You should be. Thank you. I'm sorry. Yes. Do you still have the, the breakfast once a month at your... Uh, uh, yes. The, if, the question was asked if we still have the breakfast once a month. Yes, that's done by the uh, Sons of the um, American Legion. Yeah. And... Which Sunday is it? It's usually the third Sunday third of the month. Third Sunday. He's yes. a son. He's yes, a son. I, I, I'm a member of the Sons of the American Legion, and I am the chief cook and bottle washer for the breakfast. So, yes, it is, it's a third Sunday. We have it this Sunday. It's uh, $10. It's open to the public. Uh, we have two types of eggs, usually two types of pancakes, although we might be doing a French toast dish as well this week. Uh, corned beef hash, bacon, sausage, That's home great. fries. And where Happy is this? Juice. Where is this? Ed? It's at the American Legion, Legion. Legion. Nine nine a.m. to eleven a.m. Okay. Nine to eleven. Yep. Okay. So, yeah, they're still they're still doing it. They they raise funds for us. They uh, they do the banners and the uh, the banners and the the, uh, field, the of honor. Field, field of honor, of honor flags. flags. This is where we have an issue. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, <laughs> There are two different there's things. Two different flags. The field of honors and are the, the flags, flags around town, and then there's the honor flag ceremony, which did you talk about that, Carl? I about, will if, if you, you want. Okay, if you so want. Carl can tell you All about right. honor flag. Um, probably around 2016, uh, we started the honor flag um, program, and what this is, if the family so chooses, we will fly the burial flag oh, yeah. of the deceased veteran. Mm -hmm at the new flagpole at Veterans Field, across from the American Legion. Um, we just have to be called. We'll do it between April and November. And actually, we're taking the last one down for the year tomorrow morning. All right. What we do is we fly, we fly the flag for three weeks. And we give the family the certificate as we show it, um, a better copy than of the one that's in the display box on the flag uh, at the field. So it's a nice program. Um, we got it going again this year. I used to handle it. Now the adjutant is doing it. Uh, I stepped away from that because I also do membership and stuff. But um, it's a nice program. But what happens, we get a call, and then I get a, I get a Gmail from the call, and it's for the field of honor flags, the smaller ones that are around town, or the banners. And then I have to transmit it over. So I told the sons, I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> so straighten out your website. I says, because I'm not going to be a middleman. Anyway, that's my going on that. But the, uh, so there are two different programs. 
the honor flag, which is the burial flag that the veterans and sons join us. Uh, and we have a ceremony when we raise the flag and we take it down. Whereas the, honor the field of honor and the banners are run through the sons and it's during the better portion of the year because they'll be coming down, aren't they, uh, Ed? Yes, they come down. Uh, they'll probably be down by Thanksgiving weekend with the exception of the ones along the electric parade route. Those will stay up longer. So that's what we have going. And the breakfast, of course, once a month. Um, and it's this coming Sunday. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Well, well thank you so thank you. much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. And please tell our, our veterans that we are, we're very proud of them and that we, we thank them for their service. Thank you very much. Thank I'll you. Tell as many as I can. Okay. Thank you very much. Wonderful organizations. Um, next, we have Wendy from Hudson Valley, New York Presbyterian Hudson Valley Hospital Center is going to introduce our guest speaker. Hi, everyone. My name is Wendy McNamara. I'm Community Affairs Coordinator at New York Presbyterian Hudson Valley Hospital. We'd like to thank Rosemary and the entire board for inviting us to come back and speak. And we appreciate all of you being here today. It is my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Leah M. Katz, Dr. Katz is a board-certified radiation oncologist at New York Presbyterian Hudson Valley Hospital and assistant professor of radiation oncology at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. Dr. Katz grew up in Westchester, local. Dr. Katz leads the clinical trial program at Hudson Valley Hospital, partnering with Columbia University Medical Center to offer patients the best advancements in care Without any further ado, Dr. Katz, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. All right. Thank you, everybody, for having me. And, Wendy, thank you for the introduction. And thank you so much, you know, for allowing us to do these presentations. Um, I am from Westchester, born and raised. I grew up in Briarcliff. I now live in Tarrytown. And, um, you know, being back in Westchester and serving the community, especially this great community that I've gotten to know over the past five years, um, this is my first job at a residency, has been really wonderful for me. So it's really nice to be here in person and to connect face-to-face uh, -face and not over Zoom. So I just want to give a very, very quick, and I do apologize, I have to run out of here at around 1.45. I have a patient at 2, and I don't, I know, you all know what it's like to wait for a physician, so I don't want to keep um, them waiting. I just want to very quickly run through what it's like for somebody, you know, we're just coming out of Breast Cancer Awareness Month in October, and I really just want to run through what it's like for somebody, um, you know, from mammogram to end of treatment, you know, what that patient journey is like, and also as I do that, talk about the different services that we have available, um, you know, de just down the street at Hudson Valley. Also, if you have any questions, just raise your hand, and I will, you know, call on you as we go. That's totally welcome, because I know it's really hard to remember questions, um, you know, till the end, and it will also help uh, spur discussion. So first thing I want to point out about NYP um, Hudson Valley right now is we actually have a lot of physicians that are coming up from Columbia, which I think is so nice. And I know that was part of my goal in joining a practice in Westchester is being able to offer city level care, um, but now, you know, in the community. So you don't have to get on the train, you don't have to get in your car, because I do think it's so cumbersome, um, you know, for patients to do that. You know, just a personal anecdote, my mom had cancer when I was very young. I remember her schlepping down to Memorial Sloan Kettering, and it was really, really cumbersome. And I do feel like if she had somebody, something like we have at, you know, Hudson Valley, she would have gone there. So I'm very proud to do that. Um, in terms of breast, just, just want to point out, you know, the faculty, the Columbia faculty that are at Hudson Valley, we have a new radiologist who's amazing, Dr. Koningsberg. She's, um, you know, she's born, you know, trains at Columbia, and we have two breast surgeons um, who are Columbia faculty as well. They come up twice a week and also operate at Hudson Valley. Um, so just to start off with a patient's journey, I know, I know many of the women here have, have probably had a mammogram. 
starting at age 40 um, and then annually, which is the current recommendation for women to get a screening mammogram. Now, I think something that might be, you know, more of interest, um, you know, in this talk is when should you stop your mammograms? And I don't know if any of you have had conversations with your physician about it, and it can be very, very confusing. Um, one entity called the ACOG, the American College of Gynecology, says that women should stop at 75. And ACR, the American College of Radiology, says that women should stop when they're about within five to seven years of, an, like, of when they would be expected to die, um, which sounds very morbid. <laughs> and it's, it is fun. It is actually really funny because that's such a hard thing to know. Um, I can tell you, Anyone sitting here who got in a car or walked here or who took public transportation, I don't group you in that, in that group. But there are people, as they get elderly or even not, or for one reason or another, have really severe heart conditions, lung conditions, or might be in a nursing home. You know, those are people that, you know, in conjunction with their physician, should be talking about that they don't need to be doing screening mammograms probably don't need to be doing screening colonoscopies. But for everybody here, I would say, as long as there's not another reason, you should continue to get your annual mammogram. It is really important. And if you're told otherwise by your primary care physician, I do think it's worthwhile to talk to somebody else about it if you want. Um, you know, I know any of the breast physicians at Hudson Valley, if you wanna make an appointment with them just to discuss that, would be happy to see you. You can come talk to me. You can come talk to breast surgery. You can also talk to our wonderful medical oncologist who does chemotherapy and endocrine therapy, uh, Dr. Vineet Karor. And so mm -hmm. I think that's really important because it's not a, um, a, not a decision to be taken lightly um, about when you stop your screening mammograms. So that's just the first thing I want to say. At Hudson Valley, we have every single modality available for screening of the breast. Um, we do tomosynthesis mammograms, which is the most high-level mammogram you can get. Um, and we also do, obviously, ultrasounds, and we also offer breast MRI. Dr. Koningsberg, who I mentioned, um, you know, she's like nationally known. She's such a treasure to now have at the hospital. She does all of the biopsies herself, and she really is an excellent radiologist, and we're very lucky to have her. She joined about a year ago, um, I want to say. So she really is excellent, and she actually has a partner that joined about six months ago who's also excellent and just as well-known. So, you know, that's what's available to you in terms of screening. If you do have a breast cancer that's found, um, we have, again, two great female breast surgeons, Dr. Roshni Rao and Dr. Stacy Ugras. Um, again, both Columbia faculty. They come up to Hudson Valley. They operate at Hudson Valley. And they're very available. Um, so I think you know those are two amazing options for us to have, especially with them being female, because a lot of female patients do want to see a female breast surgeon. They offer um, you know small partial mastectomies, which is where just one part of the breast is taken out to every you know along the spectrum to a mastectomy with reconstruction, where you have all of the breast tissue taken off and then you have an implant put in. So everything is really available um, surgically at Hudson Valley. One thing I really want to highlight is something that I do as a team with the surgical team, which is called intraoperative radiation. It's where when we do a small breast surgery, we actually give a shot of radiation at the time of the surgery. Hmm. And for very small um, breast tumors in, and in women over 50, this is a really great, convenient option. Um, we're one of, I think, really, I think we're one of three places in Westchester that does this really high, you know, high level mm -hmm. technique. And it's just so convenient. If you don't get that and then you need radiation, radiation is usually somewhere between four to six weeks. So in terms of convenience, um, it is really a really great option. Um, so again, that's called intraoperative radiation. You might see it on the internet as IORT. Um, so that's, that's an option available. Um, you know, in terms of radiation, I do all of the breast cancer at Hudson Valley Hospital. I see almost every breast cancer patient that comes through the system, um, whether they need radiation or not. So just to give, you know, my opinion, um, you know, we have a great radiation therapy staff at the department. Um, we have a really good machine. We're getting another machine very soon within the next year and a half. And I, most patients are very satisfied, um, at least on our patient surveys, with the care they receive um, in the radiation department. 
In terms of medical oncology, which encompasses, again, like chemotherapy or endocrine therapy, endocrine therapy is um, tamoxifen, if you've ever heard that word, or arimidex. Those are medications that you might go on after um, you have your breast surgery or before in some cases, and that is managed by Dr. Vineet Karor, Mm -hmm. also a great physician at Hudson Valley Hospital. Um, He was trained down in Texas at a very, very busy place. So he has seen everything, and he's really um, a really wonderful guy. Mm -hmm. Um, In addition to, you know, the, the actual physicians at Hudson Valley, there's great patient navigation. So if you have an, if you have a diagnosis of breast cancer and are completely overwhelmed, understandably, you can call a navigator and say, like, what do I do? Like, make all my appointments for me, <laughs> set up a ride for me, you know, and that is really, I think, crucial. Um, you know, no matter what age you are, this is incredibly overwhelming. So that's something I want to point out. Um, And we also have a really great physical therapy department at Hudson Valley. And for women who have breast cancer surgery, sometimes there can be issues with swelling in the arm or even movement issues or even the breast can swell and then deflate or swell. So the physical therapy department at Hudson Valley is very special. Um, You know, they have two two physical therapists who are very specially trained in breast surgery. And that's really not, that's very rare. You know, that's a really nice thing to have. There are people who get treated elsewhere who come to Hudson Valley just for their breast cancer physical therapy care. So, you know, there's a lot going, there's a lot of amazing things going on at Hudson Valley. Um, You know, and I just, uh, I'm really, really very thankful to have this opportunity and hope to do more in the future to get the word out. And, uh, you know, if I can ask a favor, just, you know, tell your friends and family um, and, you know, my cards are here. My office number is here. If you have any questions, concerns, if there's any, you know, <laughs> if you just have a random question about breast cancer, feel free to call me. Um, and I'd be happy to answer anything. So that is my, that is my spiel. <laughs> Do, any questions? Yeah. You talked about, I've never heard of this endocrinology therapy. Endocrine therapy, yes. Endocrine therapy. Yes. So it's it's not a it's not a great term for the therapy because endocrine people usually think of uh, like other things, but so endocrine therapy is when women when someone has a breast cancer that's like it's called estrogen receptor positive. All it means is it has like a protein on the top of it that picks up estrogen, like is fed by estrogen. So once a person has their surgery they can go on something called endocrine therapy that blocks the estrogen. So it's, you know, and the studies have shown that it can decrease a recurrence. Mm. So that's why people do that. In place of chemotherapy? Um, not, so if you need chemo, it's not in place of chemo. It's in addition to chemo. Most women, though, who are diagnosed with an early stage breast cancer these days, um, especially in the population over 50 or 60, will not need chemotherapy. They will only need endocrine therapy. Okay, mm-hmm. that's great. That's great. I, I have to uh, put in a plug for Dr. Karor. He's a wonderful, besides being an excellent doctor, he's also a very nice person yes. and easy to talk to, which is important when, you're, uh, when you have an issue, that you can talk to a person and be candid with them, and, and he certainly fits that profile. So Yes, yes. I will tell him. He'll be yes. very happy to hear Yes, yeah. absolutely. It's also wonderful that we can have this kind of of, of therapy or this kind of hospital uh, services uh, services uh, so close to home. Yeah, I think it's great. You know, these are world-class, some of them world-class physicians, and you can get in your car and be there in, in less than 10 minutes. You know, this is a wonderful thing, especially if you are undergoing a, a, any kind of an issue because uh, it is a strain, and uh, it, it's easier if you have something closer to home. So yeah, it's that's wonderful. Yes, any questions? I'm supposed to go for a breast examination, Uh you know, get the mammography, is that what it is? But then it says I'm supposed to have another uh, one also, a second type of... Ultrasound? Yeah. Yeah, so they do them together. So they look at different things and they're, they're, they're most effective together. So you'll have a screening mammogram and an ultrasound. Is there any reason why I have to have the ultrasound? They just want to make sure they're not missing anything on the mammogram. There are things that are mammographically silent that you can only see on an ultrasound. So standard of care is to do them together. 
<laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. they're very thorough. I have yeah. to. I have to say though, because I've been going that that particular place as long as I've been here, it doesn't hurt like it used to hurt. They're real. They're really. Yeah. They've improved. They've improved so much that they do it, and it's over. It really doesn't hurt like it used to. Yeah. I know. No. Yeah. Two. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But it used to hurt. It used yeah. to hurt so much. But I don't know what they've done different. But it's so it's different. It's just better now. technique, better yeah. technology. It doesn't yeah. hurt. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. That's yeah, wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, yeah. thank you very much. Um, I would like to tell you that um, fortunately, supervisor could not be here today because he was called out of the office, and I would like our liaison Ed Lactum and our councilman to talk to us a little bit about what's going to happen now with the supervisor who was elected to the assembly and what the procedure is for that spot to be filled and when that will happen. Could you come to the microphone? Thank you. Councilman Lachterman. Good afternoon, all. <clears throat> so in the event of a a board member or a supervisor moving to another position, it leaves an open position effective January 1st. So in this case, nothing can happen until there's an open position. At that time, the town board will then have 30 days to discuss, uh, if needed, do we elevate, well, immediately at that point, the, the uh, deputy supervisor, who is currently Councilman Tom Diana, is, super, is, uh, is elevated to the supervisor position. So there's always a supervisor. I believe the last time this happened in our town was under uh, Linda Cooper's reign, uh, when Alice Roker was actually the uh, clerk and the uh, deputy supervisor, and she took over for the remaining period of uh, Linda's uh, uh, term. <clears throat> so the town board, once that happens, has 30 days to make a decision on if they would like to make that appointment for the deputy supervisor to continue through the rest of the term, which is basically a year, or would they like to run a special election? Um, and it, it's really a matter and if, uh, if the board can decide and get the votes to say, hey, no, you know what, let's finish this off, or do we want to spend the money on a special election and uh, and try to uh, try to bring someone on, and then in that in that case, then there's an open board seat, which once again can be assigned by the board if there's a decision on that. It could go for a special election, or I believe, uh, and I have to look into this. It can remain open as that did happen one year where we had open board seats uh, without a special election, and they they remained until the uh, the following election day, which. Our election day for that would be the 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 Tuesday after the first Monday of November of 2023. So it would be 11 months before that uh, that uh, election. Okay. So Matt Slater, our current supervisor, maintains his position for 30 days. No, mm -hmm. he no, maintains no. his position till the end of the year. The end of the year. I'm sorry. He, fin yeah. he finishes off this this year. Okay. The new term starts. Actually, I think it, I, if I'm not mistaken. New Year's Day may be a Sunday this year, so then it's actually January 2nd, that Monday, the new term will start, and um, then he vacates the position of supervisor. The deputy supervisor steps into that slot, and then the decision process goes through the town board at that point. I see. It goes through the town board. Yes. And how long did you say that the uh, Councilman Diana can stay in that position? Well, he could stay 30 days unless, 30 days. unless voted by, Damn. well, actually, he could stay until a special election would be run off. So he would stay there while there is no supervisor. So we have 30 days to decide, is he going to be appointed or is there going to be a special election? Okay. And if he's appointed, he remains in that, in that seat through the end of the year. And, uh, and then, then he has the option in November of running again mm -hmm. uh, to see if, he, if, if the town would like to elect him as a supervisor mm -hmm. for another two and years. And then you have to replace Tom. Yeah. 
uh, then we would have, well, yes. And, and I'm not sure, and that, that I have to look into. Uh, I have not had an opportunity to talk with our council. I am not sure if you have to replace a councilman or not. Oh, okay. The supervisor being a full-time position and the, ex the only executive position in the town does need to be filled. Okay. What is the cost of an election? Ooh, the cost of the elections are very expensive. Very expensive. Very expensive because they have to open all the polling places. They have to train. They have to have the people. They have to print the material. And Yorktown would? It, Yorktown would pay that. So uh, if, uh, in my, my humble opinion of what it's worth, uh, as my wife says that in a quarter, won't even make a phone call anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, but in my opinion, it's a very expensive prospect for the town. And if the board can agree upon it, uh, for the one year, I think that it's a, a wonderful right. uh, option to to uh, have that continuity instead of starting an, and, and, and a second election. Councilman season. Diana is very well versed on everything that goes on in the town, so it's really uh, you know we're happy to have you all. Yes. Yes. Right. Absolutely. And, and, absolutely. And, and, I w and I will say that um, he is. Well, when, when you take on the term of uh, of deputy supervisor, that is yeah. that is sort of one of the implied. Uh, and I will say, with the projects that we have coming up in our town, um, I can't think of anyone more qualified because right. there are a lot there are a lot of projects, uh, as you would say, shovel in the ground projects. And Tom Diana is, uh, you know, do, do, is shovel in the ground type of guy. Yes. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Frank. Good way to put it. And so. thank you to uh, Mrs. Dorr, school teacher, <laughs> to make sure I define that properly. Yes. Will that, yeah. will that be a big deciding factor on what, what they're going to do? I'm Have sorry? A special election. Is that a big... Well, it's... Could you repeat the question? The, so the, people... the question is, will it, will, will the, what will be the big deciding factor on uh, running a special election or not? And that, that's really the only deciding factor. Does the board, want, does, does the board feel confident to, to have him take over that position for the one year? I, I do not see an issue with that, personally. But that's, you know. Anybody have any questions about that, the process? <coughs> good. You did a good job. Oh, yes. Yeah. So while, while I'm up here, though, I would like to ask, I know we have at least one veteran in the room, but can, can all of our veterans please stand up that are here today? <coughs> He was here already. Here well, we have uh, Ed Safone back there. And representing our veterans, Ed, thank you for your service. <laughs> not, not only in the military, but you've done a lot of, uh, you, you know, you've been a, a good watchdog. The other for gentleman the also. Yeah. Another gentleman oh, I'm sorry. Who's the, oh, Ron. How are you, Ron? I'm sorry. I did have cataract surgery recently, and, and my eyes are really adjusting, so I'm not wearing my glasses. How are you, sir? Ron is a Vietnam veteran and uh, a personal friend. Nice, nice to see you here today. Um, so uh, I want to want to say that, and I, I would also like to, you know, just uh, a couple things with Carl. Uh, if any, if any of our military or if anyone here has had a father, or grandfather, or you have, uh, you know, grand grandchildren or children that would like to join the Sons of the American Legion, is an organization where my father served. I did not, but I'm able to do service in his honor uh, by working with the Sons of the American Legion, and that gives you an opportunity to get out there. And we meet uh, once a month. Do, do, uh, we have uh, our breakfast once a month as well, so that's uh, two times in the month. Uh, and it's a great way to give back into the community and to show respect and honor our veterans. And uh, one thing that I'm a uh, little disappointed isn't going to happen this year, but we're looking for 2024. We are looking to bring the Medal of Honor Parade to Yorktown, oh, that'd uh, be great. whether it's part of our Memorial Day ce celebration or something for Armed Forces Day. Uh, I have been working with uh, Eugene Parada, who also works with uh, homes for veterans that are injured, injured. It's Purple Heart Homes. And uh, they, they help run that parade. And uh, I just actually found out today that we are not going to get it for 23 because one of the towns that they had been doing it in is begging for them to come back. Uh, but we are hoping to uh, see that in 2024. Just, just one yeah, item yeah. I would like you to do, be, mainly also for our televised audience. Sure. Plus here, A lot of people really don't know about Patriots Park. 
which is a beautiful, beautiful place. I don't know if you know about it. And if not, if you could just tell them a little bit, a bit about it so our sure. televised audience can hear it too. So, so Patriots Park is actually located behind Town Hall mm -hmm. on the east side of the building by where the skate park is. Mm -hmm. uh, it is the old turnaround from the old Putt train station. So the trains used to use that as a turnaround and, and be able to go north or south. Uh, the, at the park, there, are, there is an American flag, and mistakenly, we have all the branches of the military except for two problems. One is there's a flag for the Merchant Marine, which is actually not a recognized branch of the military, although Merchant Marines have been recognized as military personnel during World War II when they were transporting munitions. <clears throat> So it's not really supposed to be there, uh, as Car actually Carl Libertor pointed out to me uh, recently. And we're, we're working on getting the missing branch of the government, which is the Space Force of our military, mm -hmm. and getting a Space Force flag there to replace it. Now, I personally have, uh, have a warm spot in my heart for the Merchant Marines, only because uh, I've had, I do a lot of veteran social groups in the, in the uh, senior living homes, and I've had a few merchant marines that have been part of that and uh knowing what they what they experienced and being out on the you know they were basically put out on the ocean and it was like hey you know what we're not really going to give you an escort because we don't want to draw any attention to you uh but we're going to load you down with enough munitions to blow up a small country <laughs> <laughs> so uh so it was very dangerous uh, the the uh the axis forces were very familiar with the fact that that those ships that were unescorted were probably carrying munitions, so it put a bigger target on them. Uh, it just made them harder to find. Uh, but, uh, you know, a, a very valuable uh, group of people, and uh, we, we, we honor them, but uh, from, a, from the military point of view, the Merchant Marine is uh, merchant, not military. So we will eventually replace that flag with uh, Space Force. Okay. And then... Is there any thought ever given to sons and daughters of American Legion? <laughs> so I have asked the question. Uh, Carl had mentioned the Ladies Auxiliary, uh, which, was, which was the daughters and wives version of the sons. Um, will it ever change? I, I can't tell you. You could flip a coin with the military. Uh, on on what, what, they will, what they will do for political correctness or not. Uh, I think that uh, it would be great to have that opened, as, I, as a lot of people don't know. And, you know, this is an important aspect I think Carl might have missed. There are a lot of female veterans right. who do not feel comfortable joining the VFW or the American Legion because there is a lack of female veterans in there. Now, the American Legion is starting to change that. We have that I know of two very active members. Uh, one, Robbie, is, is the bartender there, and she's there on Friday nights with the, uh, with the happy hour that they have, or most. I think there's one that she's not. And then there's also this young lady, Linda, who's been, uh, you know, very, she's very active. She's retired Air Force, and Linda has been helping out with, uh, Carl had mentioned, the final salutes that we do at the funeral homes, and she's been helping out with the chaplain speeches for that. Uh, and just very, very involved. Uh, so we're hoping that that grows. If uh, any of the f uh, women veterans out in, out in uh, TV land listening, please look into it. it is a, it's, it's great to have that um, camaraderie. And, and I will say that, you know, as, as I know Carl, and there was a question about walking in or calling the Legion or the VFW, <coughs> Uh, those gentlemen will try to help as much as they can. There's the old military adage of no man left behind or woman left behind, and they really try to do that. They try to help out as much as possible. Uh, you know, I'm waiting for them. Uh, we're, we're looking to help uh, the wife of a, a veteran, trying to get some information. They were reaching out. Uh, the VFW has uh, Mike Sheridan, who I believe is their adjutant, who's a West Point graduate and really knows his way around a lot of the system. And the Post has their adjutant, Pat McDonough, who is wonderful at helping out as well. So uh, they really do try to help and do what they can. 
uh, and that if you have any questions about the governmental aspects like your taxes, you could always stop in and see Kim Penner in our uh, tax office, our, our tax assessor's office. Kim could uh, help guide you through that. She's very, she's very accommodating. Yes. She's a lovely person. And she's helping me with something with, uh, with uh, disabled veteran pensions mm -hmm. to, to try to get those so they're not counted as income towards uh, a veteran's um, income status. Uh, because believe it or not, a small pension can put a, could, could, yeah, could put someone over the top and cost them more than they're making right, in their right. pension. So we're He's hoping very to, accommodating. Good for you. Mike. We're hoping yeah. to do something uh, town-wide, and uh, we're working on that. Unfortunately, she's away this week, so I can't mm -hmm. uh, follow up with her. Right. She's very she's yeah. very willing to help. Absolutely. Yes. And I will tell you, any of our departments will mm -hmm. we'll try to help right. them as best they can. We have a, a great workforce in our town, and uh, I'm sure you, you all know it. So. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Sir, any other questions? questions? question. They do not right now. They, so are you stepping one. up to volunteer? Let's start one. Are you step? <laughs> yeah, and, and we do find that, and, and that's something Carl alluded to, where we only have uh, about 180 members combined in our posts. A lot of people that I know that have moved up from Yonkers and New Rochelle and, and different areas of Bronx, they remain in their post. That's mm -hmm. And they'll make, yeah. yeah. But Jersey's well, a long we'll have drive. to start one here. We're going to have to talk a little bit. <laughs> Was there any, uh, any other questions I could help with? Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. All right, I'd like to, uh, Ellen Bloom could not be here today. She is the Director of Community Outreach for New York Presbyterian Hudson Valley Hospital. Uh, if you remember my comments from last time, she's kind of an honorary member of the Senior Advisory Committee of Yorktown, even though she's not a resident, but she's very helpful. And her assistant, Wendy, is here today. So we thank them and thank uh, New York Presbyterian Hudson Valley Hospital for sponsoring our lunch program, and they're always very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Please give, give Ellen our best. Um, we want to thank you all for coming. Uh, we wish you all a happy Thanksgiving. Uh, please look on uh, your television to see where and if we're having a meeting in December. Uh, if we do, we may be having it at the library in Shrub Oak. Uh, because they have wonderful programs and we'd like to introduce our seniors to their programs. That's not, that hasn't been decided as yet, so be, be, be sure to, uh, and I will let the town clerk know as well, so if any of you are in town, you can ask them as well. So thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it, and we look forward to seeing you again, and have wonderful Thanksgiving. Thank you.